Good afternoon and welcome. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the third annual Herma Hill K Memorial Lecture. Herma was a giant in legal education and truly a transformative figure in the history of Berkeley Law. She grew up in South Carolina, attended Southern Methodist University, and then the University of Chicago Law School. After graduation, she clerked for California Supreme Court Justice Roger Traynor. She joined the Berkeley Law faculty in 1960 and was a beloved teacher and colleague for 57 years until her death in 2017. She was the second woman to join the law school faculty here at Berkeley. She was dean from 1992 to 2000, and she was the Barbara Nachtream Armstrong Professor of Law, named after the first woman on the Berkeley Law faculty, and the first woman law professor in the United States. Professor Kay was an expert in family law and conflicts of law. She was a renowned scholar in both of these areas. She had a profound impact on the lives of so many students, faculty members in this institution. I am so very grateful to Pam Samuelson and Bob Gushan for the inspiration and financial support to begin this lecture series. I might mention already a couple of books related to it. This spring, Herman Hill Kay's final work will be published. It's a book about the history of women law professors by especially focusing on the first women to become law professors in the United States. She'd worked on this for many years and I'm delighted that it's been completed and will soon be published. And as you recall, the first Herman Hill Kay Memorial Lecture was delivered by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It was Justice Ginsburg being interviewed by a former clerk, our own professor, Amanda Tyler. They've turned that lecture and some other writings of Justice Ginsburg into a book, and it too is gonna to be published this spring by University of California Press. I regard the Herma Hill K Memorial Lecture is one of the most important events in the year for Berkeley Law. So I am tremendously excited to introduce to you Judge Diane Wood, who will deliver the third annual Herma Hill K Memorial Lecture. Judge Wood is a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. And before we began, we were talking about how Judge Wood knew Herma Hill K from their work together at the American Law Institute. Judge Wood graduated from the University of Texas, both college and law school. She then clerked for Judge Irving Goldberg on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and for Justice Harry Blackman on the United States Supreme Court. She worked for a time in the office of the legal advisor for the Department of State and then the law firm of Covington Burling. She began her teaching career at Georgetown University and then soon became a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. She took time off from being a professor to work in the United States Department of Justice. And in 1995, President Bill Clinton named her to a position on the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. She continues to teach at the University of Chicago Law School. She's telling me how she taught civil procedure in the fall quarter there. She has the reputation of being one of the most outstanding judges in the country, truly a brilliant jurist. And I cannot imagine anybody better to deliver the Herma Hill K Memorial Lecture than Judge Diane Wood. With that, I'll turn it over to Judge Wood. Glad to have questions at the end of the program that you can submit as always. Well, thank you very much, Erwin, for that very kind introduction. It is such an honor uh, to be here, to be able to deliver this lecture um, in memory of Herma and really inspired by uh, her life and her values and her record. Uh, I found this in some ways a daunting undertaking because just a quick look at Herma's scholarship and her contributions, not only to Berkeley Law, but really to the entire United States, I don't wanna limit this to law schools, shows the breadth of her interests and the challenge uh, that one faces trying to do her justice. But this is 2021, and in the end, for me, one critical theme stood out uh, in the wake of this national experience that we have shared over the last year. 
some people are calling it the cursed year 2020. It is her commitment to what we would today call diversity and inclusion. I'm reminded of an archetypical scene that occurs in more than one movie. Someone is about to fall into the abyss and another person safe on top reaches out with a hand to grab the imperiled person and pulls that person in. Think of the return of the king where at the end Frodo is about to plunge into the pit of doom but Sam reaches out his hand and pulls Frodo to safety. Or if you prefer, think of Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade, where first Indy tries to save Elsa, who won't accept the help, and falls to her death. But then his father reaches out a hand to him. He seizes it, and his father pulls him up and out of the crevasse. At least two messages emerge from these scenes. First, far from smugly saying, well, I'm okay, so why should I care about you? The helper gives his utmost to save someone. And secondly, the person in need must be willing to take the help or it's all for naught. From the moment in 1960, quite some time ago, we can all do the arithmetic, when she began her teaching career at Berkeley Law, Herma extended a hand to anyone who needed it. Women, the disabled, people of color, anyone else found a ready smile, an attentive listener, and a problem solver in Herma. She was, for very understandable reasons, especially interested in the position of women, since she was then one of a tiny handful of women law professors in the entire country. Thanks to her, as Erwin has just mentioned, their story has been preserved. I actually talked to her a little bit about this book myself at some point along the way. And we will soon see volume one of Paving the Way, the First American Women Law Professors. Interestingly, this book is edited by Patricia Kane, who happens to be the first and only woman law professor I had over three years at the University of Texas. So naturally, the inclusion of women was both a moral and a personal priority for Herma. And to put it mildly, the importance of this topic has only become more apparent over time. We have all watched with distress as we've seen the disparate impact the coronavirus pandemic has had on communities of color. We've all been confronted with the fact that our policing and criminal justice systems look very different to the black and the Latinx communities than they do to whites. We've seen the Me Too movement grow like wildfire. And on a more positive note, we now have a president who has put diversity and inclusion at the top of his agenda. So this afternoon, or what feels like evening for me, I thought it would be interesting to reflect on how our current legal concept of diversity and inclusion came about, and to think about how it has mapped onto the actual state of the world. So just for convenience, I identify three principal eras. The first one I call the anti-discrimination era, the second one I call the affirmative action era, and the third, which we are still in, is the diversity and inclusion era. Maybe someday we won't need to think about this at all. People will be people and they will wind up in roles that suit them by temperament and skill and interest and any other factor you can imagine. But we're not there yet. Naturally, we could begin our exploration practically any time, certainly before the anti-discrimination era. And in fact, even the date or decade that we should identify as the beginning of the anti-discrimination era is debatable. The problems of exclusion and systemic bias have been present in North America since at least the time the Europeans began settling it in the 17th century. The Puritans, for example, were hardly models of non-discrimination. The indigenous people drew their own lines and we know well the sorry story of the treatment of indigenous people by the newcomers. And of course, as the New York Times 1619 series on the introduction of African people to the area that became the United States so well illustrated, the Africans were always pushed into the category of the other. So this is the backdrop against which the creation of our government took place. So it should therefore come as no surprise, though nothing to celebrate, that the Constitution reflects our original sin, both with respect to the Black Africans and with respect to the, quote, Indians. Remember that the infamous three-fifths clause of Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, not only establishes the three-fifths rule, it also refers to Indians not taxed. 
So it wasn't until the Civil War amendments to the Constitution in the mid-19th century that we begin to see the glimmers of an anti-discrimination principle in our law. Those glimmers didn't begin to glow until the middle of the 20th century, when the brilliant legal strategy developed and implemented by Thurgood Marshall, Jack Greenberg, Charlie Houston, and the many others who worked with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund began to bear fruit. Cases such as Sweat versus Painter, about graduate education, Brown versus Board, tore down the shibboleth of separate but equal and launched a new national effort to address racial discrimination. This is an effort that is not yet finished. So what followed immediately, first in the courts and then later in Congress, was a series of efforts to make a reality of the non-discrimination norm. Segregated schools, segregated public parks, segregated swimming pools, to name a few, were all the subject of litigation, often but not always successful in the years following Brown. When Congress added the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968, to the anti-discrimination arsenal, one might have thought that we would move quickly to a society in which all citizens could participate equally. But of course that didn't happen. And the reason was not solely because of foot dragging on the part of employers, places of accommodation, banks, or landlords, though that certainly took place. Traditionally marginalized groups suffered from embedded disadvantages, the legacy of centuries, it was not possible to wave a magic wand and create children with strong academic backgrounds, ready to attend the best public schools or universities, or with qualifications for the kind of stable and well-paying jobs that would open the door to economic equality. And we learned to our sorrow that laws designed to assure formal equality could not, standing alone, fix that problem it became apparent that much more was needed and different things were needed for different groups. Whether you identify them by age, ethnicity, neighborhood, economic status, whatever. So I thought one way we could track the effectiveness of these measures that we've undertaken is to see what impact, if any, they have had on the actual position of different groups. So they're empirical researchers much better than I, but I looked at census data, I looked at other data, and took 1960 as my baseline year. I did that both because that's the year Hermit joined the law school, but also 14th Amendment's in place, Brown versus Board of Education is in place, um, and things are beginning at least to move. So what do we find in 1960? I would say in short, a very discouraging picture. The Census Bureau reports that as of 1960, the median income for men was $4,080, while women earned less than a third of that amount, 1,261. More men than women had bachelor's degrees or higher, even though a greater percentage of women, interestingly, finished high school. The story was grim for people of color. Only 3.5% of blacks of either sex had a college degree versus 6.6% of whites. And the high school completion rate for blacks was half that of whites. Another telling statistic is incarceration rates, which unfortunately are basically the same throughout the entire period I've looked. Um, the incarceration rate among the African-American population has vastly exceeded, vastly exceeded its share of the national population. So not a great baseline. Congress takes action, of course, in the 1960s and I just mentioned uh, the key laws, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, et cetera. I might also throw in Title IX of the Education Amendments. And these were supposed to make this promise of equality a reality. In the meantime, too, the executive branch wasn't idle. President Johnson strengthened Executive Order 11246, which directed equal opportunity in federal contracting, all aspects. But nonetheless, progress is slow. Title VII, as you know, makes it unlawful to discriminate in employment practices of various types. But almost immediately became clear that this law, ambitious though it was, was not going to be enough. One problem was that you can't win under Title VII in a disparate treatment theory 
unless you can show intentional discrimination. And that's all there was at first. Not until 1971 does the Supreme Court recognize in the Griggs against Duke Power Company that practices with a disparate impact can also be reached under Title VII. They said in an opinion by Chief Justice Warren Burger, practices, procedures, or tests neutral on their face and even neutral in terms of intent cannot be maintained if they operate to freeze the status quo of prior discriminatory employment practices. And the court went on to say the act, meaning the Civil Rights Act, Title VII, proscribes not only overt discrimination, but also practices that are fair in form, but discriminatory in operation. So that sounded promising, although interestingly, it was only a few years later that the Supreme Court announced that the Constitution through the Equal Protection Clause reaches only purposeful discrimination. I'm talking about the Washington versus Davis decision of 1976. This has actually led to a debate about whether Congress went too far by permitting disparate impact cases under its powers under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment and the Commerce Clause, or whether maybe it was just legitimately enacting prophylactic laws that are well within its authority. So we can just put a marker for that. I won't pursue it. So you can view the developments of the 1960s as inching toward a recognition that equality was not going to come about by itself. Doors had to be opened as Executive Order 11246 recognized, even though a distressing number of people were trying to keep them locked. Equality in the workplace had to be assured before any kind of economic equality would happen. But now moving up to the year 1970, I, did, I looked at these statistics in 10 year um, groups, not very much had changed. Women were still very far behind in median income, um, $2,237 annually, which was roughly a third of their male counterparts, 6,670. In terms of education, once again, women and men were basically equal at the high school level, but men had a considerable advantage uh, in holding bachelor's degrees or more. Um, blacks, again, remained far behind. The data on the Latinx population is not, at least what I was able to find, is not that great for this period. Black median income in 1970 was $5,537, while whites were bringing home $9,097 and there was still a big education gap as well. So, you know, it tells you, great, you know, we've started the job, we have an anti-discrimination principle, we actually do have laws that are trying to make a difference, but not much of a practical dent yet. So what was to be done? People like Herma Hill Kay were diligently working to ensure that traditionally disadvantaged groups, including women, racial, and ethnic minorities could be brought into mainstream society, whether that meant admission to what was then called Bolt Hall or its peers around the country, or the University of California and its fellow elite state institutions, or even going to the beginning of life, a more comprehensive programs for pre-K education around the country. But these efforts ran into trouble. Um, the 22 year olds who were trying to go to law school or medical school or business school had grown up as the Supreme Court had recognized in Griggs without the educational advantages that their white peers had. This pervaded their lives and have had a profound effect on the quality of the undergraduate institutions to which they might be admitted and the graduate institutions as well. The same problem existed really for students of all ages. So policies that were blind to these factors were bound to have an exclusionary effect on the disadvantaged students. And I should certainly hasten to add the disadvantage can come from a number of factors. It doesn't have to be race at all. So the question was, was action possible or were we doomed just to give a collective shrug of the shoulders for anyone older than the age of three? And if action was possible, what specifically were the realistic and legal options for people seeking some kind of inclusion in our society? So many different ways. So the answer that was tried out at this era foreshadowed by the executive order 
was affirmative action. Put neutrally, the hope was to reach out into the traditionally disadvantaged communities, find the people who were ready and able to join mainstream society and the mainstream economy and put them to work. As the 1970s wore on, institutions around the country adopted special measures designed to ensure that minorities would be included. But affirmative action, as it came to be called of any type, whether a goal, a presumption, a quota, anything else, was controversial from the start. Reconciliation with the norm of anti-discrimination was certainly possible, but it was not always easy and it was not always done. I've always thought it was interesting. One somewhat overlooked case from this period is McDonald against Santa Fe Trail Transportation Company, Supreme Court 1976 decision, which raised the question whether Title VII prohibits invidious racial discrimination in private employment against white people, just as it covers any other racial group. In an opinion authored by Justice Thurgood Marshall, the court said, of course, whites are covered by the statute, so in other words, it held that people are entitled to protection against invidious discrimination on the basis of their race. But what about measures that did not stem from invidious motives, but instead were designed to erase the effects of past discrimination or to ensure that state resources were distributed equally to all citizens of the state or to provide a culturally rich environment for all in the institution? What in short about affirmative action? It took very little time for this problem to reach the Supreme Court, both as a question of statutory interpretation and as an issue of constitutional law. So given time constraints, I'll just mention three cases from the 1970s that I think are all telling. Defunis against Odegaard, Regents of the University of California against Bakke, and United Steel Workers of America against Weber. I wish I could say that they collectively solved the problem, but that would be untrue. In fact, they did no more than set the table for later developments. In terms of a holding, defunus was nothing. The court wound up dismissing it as moot, but it was a signal that the court was about to become involved in this area. The facts were simple. The plaintiff applied for admission to the University of Washington Law School, but he ended up on the last tier of the waiting list and was ultimately unsuccessful. At the same time, the university had a special admissions process for black and minority students and for military veterans. Some of the black students, some of the veterans who were admitted had a lower score on a particular composite profile that the university created. Their score was lower than DeFunis's score. And so he contended that he would have been admitted but for the university's allegedly unconstitutional consideration of his race. Thanks to injunctive relief ordered by the state courts before the case reached the Supreme Court, DeFunis was able to attend the law school during the pendency of his case. He graduated before the Supreme Court rendered a decision, hence the dismissal for mootness. But it was clear this was just the first shot over the bow. Affirmative action quickly returned to the court in the person of Alan Bakke, who was trying to be admitted to the medical school at the University of California, Davis. In a famously split decision, the court ruled in Bakke's favor, but for lots of different reasons. Chief Justice Berger, together with Justices Stewart, Rehnquist, and Stevens, would have held that any consideration of race, no matter what the motive, is constitutionally forbidden. Justices Brennan, White, Marshall, and Blackman took the position that race-conscious programs are constitutional and really essential if society is to redress past discrimination and achieve true equality. Pretending that race is not salient for most people against overwhelming evidence to the contrary, they thought was no solution at all. So it was Justice Powell in the middle whose separate opinion came to be viewed as the authoritative holding of the court, who thought that it's permissible to use race as one factor in an admissions process, just as an institution might use legacy status, geographic origin, musical talent, athletic prowess, uh, but he felt firmly that quotas, that rigid quotas were unconstitutional. Taking that approach and looking at the Davis program, he thought this is a quota, it has to be struck down. So that gives us the Bakke result. 
Meanwhile, outside the university world, both public and private employers were facing similar problems. Colorblind policies were not producing racially diverse workplaces. So one aspect of this problem comes before the Supreme Court in Weber, which arises in the context of a union workplace where labor relations are governed by a collective bargaining agreement between the union and the employer. This particular CBA included a negotiated provision about access to training programs for craft workers. The parties had, had put together an affirmative action plan that called for a one-to-one -one ratio of minority workers and white workers in this training program. Brian Weber wanted access to the program but he was not able to get in because the, the white part of things was filled. So the question before the Supreme Court was whether Congress in Title VII uh, meant to leave private entities free to take this sort of step, race conscious steps to eliminate manifest racial imbalances. And I'll be delicate about this, using techniques of statutory interpretation that I would be very surprised to see today uh, the court answered that question in the affirmative, and it said, yes, the remedial use of race is permissible, uh, of, although, of course, not its invidious use. So for time, this is a fairly fragile status quo, but it held for a bit race and other protected statuses could be, quote, taken into account, but strict quotas were forbidden for public institutions. And private parties could negotiate and implement remedial measures if they wished to do so, but otherwise they simply operated under whatever the relevant non-discrimination regime was. That, those came, by the way, not just from federal laws. Most states had uh, complementary laws as well. So going back to my data, it, sh it still begins to show the same story. Nothing like parity had been achieved, either based on gender or on race. So in terms of median income, non-Hispanic whites are still earning almost double what blacks are, basically 19,000 to 10,000. The Hispanic origin people who now show up in the statistics, 13,651. Men still basically triple the income of women. Uh, educational attainment is skewed. Um, High school diplomas, not as bad. Whites were 68.8%, whereas blacks were 51.2 and Hispanics 44. Um, men and women about the same as always. Bachelor's degree attainment, again, whites were far ahead. Overall whites, 11.3%, white men, or, or all men, 13.5. Blacks were down at 4.4. Incarceration rates, still the very, skewed effects. Remember, again, half the prisoners in the United States were, were black, but only about they, they were only about one eighth of the population. The numbers for 1990, about the same. I won't go through them all in the interest of time, but um, th that's the picture that you get. So yes, we've been trying now since Brown versus Board of Education to do something, but it's just not filtering out as well into society as it needs to. At the same time, this sort of stubborn problem isn't getting solved. The Supreme Court was signaling increasing discomfort with the affirmative action paradigm. Its first step was to hold that the standard of review for racially conscious remedial measures is the same one that applies to all classifications based on race, strict scrutiny. Any measure that was subject to strict scrutiny tended to fail, death knell practically. So accordingly, in the city of Richmond against J.A. Croson, which was about contracting, the court held that a city's program requiring contractors to award 30% of the dollar value of their grants to minority business enterprises had to be judged under the strict scrutiny standard and it flunked. The program failed because the city had not established a compelling interest for the minority set aside and because it could not show that its plan was narrowly tailored to serve any such compelling state interest. Six years later, the court reiterates the strict scrutiny rule in Adirond constructors against Pena, which was Crozen revisited, except that it was federal contracting, not 
state contracting. But the court makes clear that that doesn't make any difference. Strict scrutiny applies no matter who it is, whichever level of government. At the same time, interestingly, uh, they went out of their way. They said, we want to dispel the notion, this is a quote, we want to dispel the notion that strict scrutiny is strict in theory, but fatal in fact, close quote, even though it was fatal in both of those cases. So what remained unclear was where does a racially conscious measure survive? Where does it become illegal? So that's where we were as we move into this last phase that I want to talk about, the diversity and inclusion phase, um, because affirmative action was really not going to be too successful under these, under these rigid you know, and, and very strict standards. So the difficulty of meeting the strict scrutiny standard and some handwriting on the wall led to a change in programs designed to combat racial, gender, and ethnic exclusion. Rhetorically, they change. They're, they're no longer said to address the need to redress historical injuries suffered by disadvantaged groups, at least in the absence I put to one side actual litigation where there's a judicial finding of past discrimination and judicially supervised remedies. That was a whole different category of cases. But instead, taking a, a, a cue from the decisions in Baki, uh, the rhetoric begins to stress the value of a broad-based and inclusive community. Nowhere is this shift better illustrated than in the Supreme Court's 2003 decision in Grutter against Bollinger, which, which was the one that involved a challenge to the University of Michigan Law School's admission program. There was a companion case about the college uh, that actually came out the other way. But here's how the court described the law school's program. This is a little bit long, but it's really important because of the rhetoric. They said, the policy aspires to achieve that diversity which has the potential to enrich everyone's education and thus make a law school class stronger than the sum of its parts. The policy does not restrict the types of diversity contributions eligible for substantial weight in the admissions process, but instead recognizes many possible bases for diversity admissions. The policy does, however, reaffirm the law school's longstanding commitment to one particular type of diversity, that is racial and ethnic diversity with special reference to the inclusion of students from groups which have been historically discriminated against, like African-Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans, who without this commitment might not be represented in our student body in meaningful numbers. By enrolling a critical mass of underrepresented minority students, the law school seeks to ensure their ability to make unique contributions to the character of the law school. And then again, they, they try to dis distance themselves from too much race consciousness. And they say, the policy does not define diversity solely in terms of racial and ethnic status, nor is the policy insensitive to the competition among all students for admission to the law school. And it goes on. So they won their case. So the University of Texas took a page from that book uh, as it was trying to craft its own diversity and inclusion policies. The University of Texas found themselves twice before the US Supreme Court in the case of Fisher against University of Texas. UT said, as Michigan had done, that they wanted, quote, to provide the educational benefits of a diverse student body to all of the university's undergraduate students. The court recognized that they only had so much room to work because in Texas, they had had a top 10% program, which actually wound up being a top 8% program, where if you were in the top originally 10% of your high school class in the state, you automatically got to go to the University of Texas at Austin. So the plan that the court was evaluating applied really to only 25% of the admissions. There, as in Grutter, the court carefully scrutinized the role that race was allowed to play, and the university convinced it that this was actually a very tiny role. It was a subfactor of one part of a holistic personal attainment evaluation. So the court says 
Okay, we're satisfied. The university has demonstrated a clear goal, limited in scope, and it has no other workable race neutral way to achieve that goal. So that's one point to make about Fisher. The other point to make about Fisher too, is that it was a five to four decision authored by Justice Kennedy. So who knows, you know, these kinds of cases are never really finished. Maybe not, maybe Fisher is finally finished, but the, but the issue will come back. Nowhere are the limits of both Grutter and Fisher more starkly illustrated than just a few years later in the Supreme Court's decision in the parents involved in community schools against Seattle School District number one decision, that's 2007 case. The justices struck down voluntary programs by two school districts. In other words, no court had forced school districts to adopt these programs. One was in Seattle and the other was in Jefferson County, Kentucky, designed to achieve some degree of racial balance. The court squarely rejects this and Chief Justice Roberts quite firmly um, takes this position. He says, accepting racial balancing as a compelling state interest would justify the imposition of racial proportionality throughout American society, contrary to our repeated recognition that at the heart of the Constitution's guarantee of equal protection lies the simple command that the government must treat citizens as individuals, not as simply components of a racial, religious, sexual, or national class. Racial balancing has no logical stopping point. And he famously ended his opinion by saying, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. So at one level, he's surely correct. If your only goal is formal equality, then you can probably assure formal equality. But if the goal is broader, more like the one described in Grutter, then we have our work cut out for us. Uh, the problem is real, but it's going to be hard to find racially conscious measures that nonetheless comply with the boundaries that the Supreme Court has established. So let me conclude with just a few thoughts. I don't wanna conclude on a bad note, um, but this is a, an important question to think about this year. The deaths of George Floyd and so many others, not just over the last year, but over a long time, tell us about the fault lines in our society. And I won't bore you with the 2020 statistics or really 2019, but unfortunately, they're not that different. Uh, the median income between blacks and whites is narrowing, the difference is narrowing somewhat, uh, but it's nowhere close to where you would want to see it. Um, incarceration figures are still disturbing. So if you look at, at outcomes in this sense, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. So I'd like to just leave you with a, a couple of suggestions uh, that have struck me as worth pursuing um, in this effort to really achieve the kind of inclusion of all of the people in this amazing society that we have and make everybody a participant. So my first thought is anytime that you're doing anything Admitting someone to a program, hiring someone, giving a person a special assignment, selling a house to them. We need to look harder to make sure that we have not inadvertently just stayed inside our own safe zone and turned to people who are just like ourselves. Uh, we need to, to push. And secondly, very closely related to that first point, we need to reevaluate what we mean when we list the qualifications for a position. I have a vivid memory of this from the days a long time ago when I was a full-time faculty member at the University of Chicago. And you know, I love the place, I'm still teaching there. It, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just an excellent place. But um, there was, a, there was a, an agreed idea of what the qualifications for a law professor entailed. And so when people with non-traditional backgrounds came along and you know, maybe they didn't clerk in the Supreme Court, maybe they didn't have a PhD, maybe they didn't have a, a degree from a law school in the top 15, what did you do? Well, you, you can't grab these credential based, you know, ideas of quote qualification and think that they tell you everything. 
Sometimes there were candidates with a rich experience that was capable of informing all of their teaching, all of their scholarship that could really expand the horizons of everyone in the school. And those people can't be overlooked. They, they may not have credentials that look exactly like the traditional ones. And in some ways, so much the better. I think the literature here on implicit bias has a great deal to offer us. Um, openness to a wide, wider variety of perspectives eliminates both the perception and the reality that uh, by looking more broadly through a much bigger pool, you are somehow sacrificing standards. I think that's not right. Um, that was what DeFunis and Baki and Fisher felt was happening to them. And my actually other point would be we, it, we at our peril, we underestimate the sincerity of their beliefs. People need to be honest and, and, and acknowledge the frustration, say that Brian Weber felt when he couldn't get into the training program. We have to uh, be aware of, of this in, in that sense as well. My third point, don't give up on training. Uh, people tend to poo-poo training and say nobody ever learns anything from it. Most employers, a lot of universities uh, have workplace training programs designed to address discrimination, workplace harassment, acceptable behavior, and so forth. And I am not so naive as to think that people are transformed by these things, but I think they set a tone. Uh, and I've seen so many employment discrimination cases where the workforce that understands that that tone is there works better. And when by the same token, an employer tolerates what we sometimes call stray remarks that are racist or in other ways demeaning to people, people don't trust the decision-making process at that workplace. So training is good. And I, I think it's, it's really worth the effort. And my final point is simply lead by example, reach out through community groups, workplace groups, Meet people who aren't like you, hire them, talk to them. If you give them a chance, they may give you a chance. I think that's exactly what Herma Hill Kay did during her entire career at Berkeley Law. I've certainly tried to do much the same thing in my little corner of the world, whether it's hiring law clerks or developing our new workplace conduct rules or day-to-day -day life. Ending discrimination is not enough. We need to create space in our rich and diverse society where everyone can play his or her part. There's never been a better time to double down on this work. And you're very lucky to be at Berkeley. Berkeley has always been a kaleidoscope of people, ideas, styles, backgrounds. Don't take it for granted. Carry forward this tradition as you go forward in life and you will be honoring the best in Professor Kay's example and that of your school. So thank you. I wish for many reasons that you were here with us in Berkeley, including that we could all give you a resounding applause for that wonderful talk. I cannot imagine a better tribute to Herma Hulkay than the remarks that you just delivered. I know we have a large live stream audience. If you want to send questions in, please send them to Whitney Mello, W-M-E-L-L-O at berkeley.edu. And if you're watching via the Zoom, you can send them in via the Q&A function there. I've gotten a couple of questions sent in to me, Judge Wood, that I'll ask. The first, I'll read it is, Baki and the cases that followed it so that affirmative action is allowed only to further diversity. Doesn't it mean that affirmative action is allowed only because it benefits whites? Wasn't the court's crucial mistake not allowing affirmative action to remedy the history of discrimination? It's an interesting point. Um... Justice Powell, remember, anchored his opinion so much in the Harvard program. It's, it was sort of interesting. Um, but he saw it as a program that was trying to achieve um, diversity in the student body. Now, whether that was more designed to give the whites a better learning environment and not paying any attention to the diverse students, whether they were you know, of a different race or whatever form of diversity they represented, it's an excellent question. What I always tried to look at, certainly in my own um, backyard, is what kind of support were you giving these students who were, you know, 
the only or you know one or two or three uh, students who were diverse in the room, if you were really trying to support them and trying to make sure that they were um, fully a part of the community, then I would feel more comfortable that this was for them. If it, if it was really just to make somebody feel like they pat themselves in the back, then that's disturbing. I, one would hope not. Thank you. Let me ask, I'll read you another question that we got. It says, you mentioned at the end the hiring of law clerks. People of color are significantly underrepresented among federal law clerks. What is the judiciary doing to remedy that? There's certainly, I mean, I was, un, until last year, actually until July, this past July 4th, um, I was the chief judge of my circuit, uh, that, which I did for nearly seven years. And that meant that I sat in the judicial conference. In addition to that, actually the most useful part of being chief judge were our meetings right after the conference where the 13 chief judges of the circuits would sit down and have discussions on topics of mutual interest. This topic came up um, and it's extremely hard, I will say, uh, other than just trying to use moral suasion to do much about what your fellow judges are doing with clerkships. I was part of this little rump group that included Merrick Garland and Sid Thomas of the Ninth Circuit and Bob Katzman from the Second Circuit and then eventually David Barron from the First Circuit trying to, at least to make sure that people weren't getting hired in their first year of law school. Trying to say, look at more people is hard. Uh, the district judges are often very good about getting the pipeline going with externs during the period of time that people are not yet ready to apply for clerkships. I've just made it known to professors in law schools that I hire from that this is a top priority for me and they send me good candidates. Um, I have, you know, a lot of people over the years have been diverse law clerks in my own chambers. Um, from this year, I have four clerks, which I don't always do, but one of them's African American, two of them are Latinx, and, and one of them isn't, you know, so it, they are that excellent people, excellent people are out there, if you will just look. Let me read you another question that I've got sent to me. You mentioned Chief Justice Roberts' opinion and parents involved. In light of that and the change in composition of the Supreme Court, do you believe it possible to achieve diversity without affirmative action? I don't know uh, what the currently constituted Supreme Court is going to do, of course. I, the reason I mentioned the vote in Grutter um, was because, well, and in Fisher, is because I, if I were to predict the, the present court is probably much more comfortable with formalistic lines than they would be with multi-factor programs. I still believe it's well worth the effort and it, it's more resource intensive, but it's worth it to look at people as a whole. Don't look at them as a grade point average. Don't look at them as you know, somebody who plays the oboe well, you know, don't look at them in, in a unidimensional way, because I think if we look at people as entire human beings, first of all, it's impossible to say, you know, I hired this person only because of their ethnicity or whatever. I hired them because of a lot of things, uh, because they were an opera singer in college, um, as one of my former clerks was. Um, so, so you really have to be real. You have to really do it in this way that the court seems willing to accept. And um, it's going to make it harder to, to attack this on, on every front, but that's about where we are, I'm afraid. I have one other question that came. You point to Washington versus Davis is pivotal in limiting the scope of equal protection. Do you see ways of overcoming Washington versus Davis? Well, that's tricky because a few years after Washington versus Davis, the court had roughly the same issue, except it was in the case, it, it was an instance of um, sex discrimination. I'm talking about Feeney against Massachusetts Board of Retirement. So one might have thought that for, in Feeney, and, and there were very strong arguments to this effect, 
that you could take a more practical view of what Washington Davis was talking about. And just so everybody knows, the, the question or the underlying issue in Feeney was that Massachusetts had a law, a rather unusual law, giving veterans an absolute preference in state hiring. It wasn't just, you know, you get a couple of points on your score. It was an absolute preference. And this was at a time that to say that you were a veteran was pretty close to synonymous to saying that you were male. There, I mean, a tiny number of women were in the military, but it was nothing like it is today. And so the people who were litigating the Feeney case thought, look, are, let's be practical. If you put this veterans preference in, they know that they're hiring only men. So why, isn't that, why doesn't that count under Washington against Davis as intentional discrimination? And the court had none of it. The court said, no, uh, and they, they used a phrase that now gets picked up in a lot of opinions. You need to be adopting this because you want to discriminate against women, not just in spite of. So because of versus in spite of. And so the court says, yeah, they are perfectly aware that this is gonna exclude all women, but it's not like they're trying to do that. They just wanna help veterans. So Feeney was a moment where it could have gone in a different direction and it didn't. So I, um, one area that I didn't touch on very much, but might have some play in the joints, I don't know. There's a whole line of cases about how far can Congress go in exercising its powers under section five of the 14th amendment. And when are they just implementing the 14th amendment and when are they going beyond it? Thinking of cases like city of Bernie. Um, if a more generous reading of Congress's explicitly conferred powers in the 14th Amendment were to be adopted by the court, then I think it's a, it's a, it's a different point of attack, if you will. But I think that there would be some hope there and Congress can, can try. Those are the questions that I received. Unless there's others, I think what I'll say is Thanks to all who watched on the live stream in the Zoom. And most of all, thank you, Judge Wood, for a truly magnificent lecture and a wonderful way to remember Herma Hill Kay. Well, thank you, all of you. It's been a great pleasure, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>